Hello, Rob. So we're back with The Witch and the Priest by Hilda Lewis, a novel based on the true story of Joan Flower, the infamous 17th century witch. And even though I'm acting like I already read the foreword and all that, I have not. I'm going to chapter one for some unknown reason, but you can stop me. Chapter one, to my beloved sister, Hester Davenport, widow of this parish, and upon her death, the son, the sum aforesaid to be used for the building and maintaining of a hospice for four poor women of this parish. The Reverend Samuel Fleming put down his pen. Now why had he done that? There were bequests more worthy of his charity, a sum to maintain some poor scholar at Cambridge, his own university, a legacy to some poor person, heaven knew, they were hard to put to it, some of them, to keep body and soul together. Learning, piety, were not these more important than the comfort of old women who could always beg a crust or scrape, a few vegetables from the ground, or find an armful of kindling in the woods. He moved restless, knowing his answer and not relishing it. Old women, if they were ugly enough or poor enough, nobody in such need of succor. Children threw stones after them, and parents, far from checking their brats, called names after them, harder than stones, more death-dealing than stones, calling witch, witch. The word had haunted him this twelve month, a burden upon his heart, ever since the women had gone to their death. Hand still upon the paper, he heard the tapping of Hester's heels along the flagged passage, even before her knock fell upon the door he had thrust the writing into a drawer. Hester fretted sufficiently about his altered looks without a reminder in the shape of a will. Her head still dark beneath the muslin cap came round the door. Brother and sister looked at each other. It was hard to believe there was but a few years between them. But though his hair had whitened completely this last year, the likeness between them was clear. The good forehead, the eyes kindly yet shrewd, shrewd repeating the promise of mouth and chin. Samuel, she said, sharp yet tender too. Your thoughts run on the matter again. Why must you torment yourself? It makes an old man of you before your time. I have passed my threescore years and ten, he reminded her rueful. What of it? She asked stoutly, pitying his frail looks. Last year your hair was dark as my own, or almost, and you carried yourself upright as any man. And now, now, Samuel, they were witches, she nodded vigorously. They were witches, all three. Joan Flower never confessed, he reminded her somber. With her dying breath, she protested her innocence. What did you expect? She denied, but God spoke. She saw how he looked about the pleasant room, as though even now the quiet air held some imprint of that dreadful day. As for the daughter, she said very firm, nothing could be clear. They confessed. Who should know that better than you? They confessed everything. He sighed, remembering Margaret, all tears and terror, remembering Philippa, all brag and bravado. Yes, it was true. Joan Flower had been a witch, and she had brought them, the two young girls, to the devil. She would have gone to the gallows with them had she not been lucky enough to die first. What was it, he asked himself, for the hundredth time that brought men and women to the devil? They live poor and wretched, blind and diseased, often as not. And in the end, they died on the gallows. He raised his troubled head. What is this power the devil has so that men and women willingly renounce their part in God? Is it that God's servants are not so zealous as the devil's? It is a question I should ask, indeed must ask. I am a priest, and the women were of my flock. I knew Joan Flower when her goodman was alive, and there were no tales either of whoring or of witchcraft. Yes, and I baptized her daughters, a decent woman, so I thought, not over devout, but coming now and then to church and bringing her girls with her. 
Yes, she made some show of virtue, Hester told him. Whether to shield her daughters from her ugly ways or to shield herself from their eyes, who can say? When the girls left home, she was not ashamed to show herself in her true colors. She came to church when it pleased her, which was seldom enough. It was then the tales began to go about. Oh no, not of witchcraft, but of the shocking life she led, of the men she welcomed at all hours. Pete and the others. I rebuked her, Samuel Fleming said. I preached against her from the pulpit, but, and he sighed, much good that did, seeing she was not there to hear. The village heard, and it turned its back on her, Hester reminded him, but much she cried, snug in her cottage, carousing with her men. I was not zealous enough. I should have gone into her house. I should have wrestled with her soul. You did go once, once only, and he sighed, remembering how he had allowed himself to be driven away. Oh, she had been polite enough, dusting a stool that he might sit. But hostility had streamed from her, pushing him out. He had felt not a priest, but an intruder. He had not gone there again. Even when the tales began to change their character, that was after the girls came home. Still, he had done little enough until it was too late. He had barely listened. It was all too fantastic. The flower women were whores, but they were not witches. You know, he told Hester now. I smiled, actually smiled. God forgave me, forgive me, at the notion of this quiet and peaceful parish of mine suddenly producing a crop of witches. I forgot there was other peaceful parishes where people went quietly about their business. And then suddenly, the witches about their ugly work, Hester finished. Pendle and Kelmsford, St. Osis and War Boys. And Derby, she counted on her fingers. Oh, and more than I can remember. Do not trouble your heart, Samuel. The hangings of last year are justified. The confessions fitted into each other like a neat piece of dovetailing. They were guilty, all of them guilty, beyond any doubt guilty. But for all that, he was troubled still. He looked about him. The fine calf bindings of his books, the good rugs upon the polished floor, the rich smell of his tobacco could not reassure him. This room, he thought, would never be free of the women. Always they would be here, coming between him and his work. Between him and his prayers, tormenting him with their accusations, they were brought to justice. Their own tongues proclaimed it, Hester cried out, passionate at the care in his face. But were they, he asked, insistent. Suppose they believed they were able to do mi mischief by witchcraft, but were unable to do mischief. After all, the king himself, that mighty witch hunter, even he has his doubts and says so. Once he exhorted all men, and in particular such of us as our priests and justices, to be zealous against witches. Now he exhorts us to caution, fear and malice on the part of the accusers, too hasty decision on the part of the judges. These King James thinks have been too long a canker in the body of the state. That comes well from him, she went over and took from a shelf of copy of De Demonologia and put it down open before him. Samuel turned the pages. It is, I suppose, he said, the most damning tract against witchcraft. And yet, how long before the king declares there's no such thing as witches at all? He's honest. If he thinks fit to alter his mind, he'll say so. One can hardly quarrel with that, I suppose, she said thoughtfully. All very well for the king, but how about those that obey his command? In particular, how about priests and magistrates and judges? And how about those poor souls who have already suffered under the king's justice? And it was at him again, a dog at his throat, the old question. Hester, he said, and again, Hester, there is a question I ask myself and go on asking and can find no answer. How if the poor hanged creatures were nothing but desperately unhappy, a little crazy, maybe with their miseries, or how if they were poor, merely and ugly and ignorant and uncouth, that and nothing more. Hester seated herself at the table, spreading the skirts of her silk gown. They were guilty, she said. Why else would they confess the crimes they never did? 
They knew well enough confession would bring them to the gallows. It is not hard, he told her sadly, to think of a reason, to think of any number of reasons, fear of the gallows to begin with, and a more desperate hope to escape it by a show of penitence or pride, inordinate pride driving them to confess the crimes they never committed, or belief, perhaps belief that they can indeed alter the laws of nature, or else hopelessness, knowing that truth in one cannot stand against the lies of the many. How many, many times has evidence been found to be false? More than one witch, so-called, has been hanged by the lying tongue of a spiteful child that knew not what it did. O oh, Hester, magistrates and judges alike are God-fearing men, yet innocent folk have hanged. Once we accept the fact of witchcraft, we must accept also the confession. I myself would have gone on believing in both to the end of my days had I not had a hand in the death of those women. Was I a righteous judge or a credulous old man? It was. It is a question I ask and go on asking. The responsibility was not yours. She put out a hand to comfort him. You did not judge the women. You were one of the magistrates and only one of them. You examined, you did not judge. You found there was a case to answer, and you sent them forward to the assize. The judge that hanged them was the chief justice himself. That should comfort me, he said, but it does not. It does not. Try as I may, I cannot shift responsibility from where it belongs, my own shoulders. Others may acquit me, my own heart, never. For the plain truth is this, the trouble began long before they were brought before me as a magistrate, and I should have known it, I should have dealt with them and as a priest. Before everything, I am a servant of God. If I had gone again to Joan Flower, if I had striven again and again, might not everything have been different? But having rebuked her, I was content to forget her. Yes, even when the tales named her not only whore, but which? Hester, there is a question I ask myself. Ask and cannot leave asking. Have I been a bad shepherd, not loving all men equally, not reckoning their souls of equal worth? You are no angel, she told him dryly. To love all men equally, nor are all souls of equal worth. No, do not argue the point. Can you pretend that the soul of any one of those wicked women is worth the soul of, let us say, Francis? And she looked at him very straight. She had hit her nail shrewdly upon the head. He was forced to admit it, for he loved Francis' manners above all men. Francis, he said softly, the lines of his face relaxed. And she was glad, knowing him released for a little while of his burden. As chin on hand, his thoughts went back to other days. More innocent days. I remember so well the day he was born and the joy bells pealing. I baptized him. I carried him in my arms when he was sick. Played with him when he was well. I loved him as a man loves his own son. And now Francis is the sixth earl. Four earls I have seen. Four earls. But then, forty years. It's a long, long time. His thoughts went back remembering Edward, the uncle of Francis, who had first brought him to Belvoir. Students at Cambridge together. King's men, both, and good friends. Though one had been heir to a great earldom and the other a simple scholar, when Edward succeeded to the title, he invited his friend, already a fellow of King's, and beginning to be known as a subtle disputant to be his own chaplain. Life was good those days to the two young men up at the castle, down at the rectory, for Edward had given him the living of Botsford, each busy about his duties and plenty of time for riding and hunting and talking. And then Edward died, young, like so many of his family, and his brother had taken the title. But John had not long enjoyed his dignities. By the end of that same year, he too was dead, leaving his two young sons, Roger eleven and Francis eight. Delightful lads, good to look upon, upright and forthright like all the manners. But even then, there had been a difference between them. 
Roger waited with his new dignities, 11 years old <laughs> and an earl, had shown a clear, hard pride. But Francis, ah, Francis, there had always been a simplicity about him, the simplicity that comes not from a great name, but from a great soul, and that simplicity had been his undoing. Samuel Fleming sighed deeply. How much of that candor, that trust in men, had come from his own fostering. He had himself strengthened the boy's innate gentleness and trustingness, holding before the child the greatest of all models. He had made Francis too vulnerable. Had he made Francis too vulnerable? Francis, he told Hester now, from the very first, so sweet, so trusting in nature, and I, God forgive me if I was wrong, strove to keep him so. I should have remembered his great position and the jealousies of men. I should have striven to make him hard, hard and shrewd. Instead, I have made him vulnerable. Francis is not vulnerable. He is strong. How many men could suffer what he has suffered in kindness not turned to poison within him? Yet he has changed, Samuel said sadly. So old and cold and shut within himself, only forty, and no more joy in life. He will come back to his own nature, Hester promised, and joy will come with it. A little time ago, goodwill to all men shone from him like a light. It was like warming your hands at a good fire, Hester nodded. They fell to silence, both of them, remembering how the young life that had begun so fair grew overcast and overcast indeed, Yet Francis had borne it all with a perfect patience. He had married young, and death had robbed him of his bride. And though he had married again to rise up, to raise up sons, and though Cecilia was loving and kind to his motherless little girl, the death of his first love had all but overthrown him. And then, a few years later, brother followed wife into the grave, and not the earldom, with all of its honors, all its riches, could comfort him, yet this, too, he had taken with courage, carrying his grief in silence, burying himself kindly and showing himself serviceable to all, rich and poor alike. And then came two little sons to bring light and laughter to his sad house. But the new life he had built with such courage he had not been let to enjoy. He had been made to suffer as few men suffer. Still, he had borne it with the most severe, sweet courage, comforting Cecilia and hiding his own heart's pain, scanting none of the duties of his great calling, and taking all from the hand of God, not knowing it had come from the hand of the devil. It had all begun over six years ago, the winter of 1612, Henry, the elder boy, had peaked a little. It is nothing, Cecilia said, a childish ailment. With the spring it will pass, but neither with spring nor summer had it passed. Instead, the first of the fits had fallen upon the four-year-old. And then fit following fit, coming quicker, coming stronger, lasting longer, and the frightened child growing daily weaker, and the physicians unable to find cause or cure. Through the long summer days, the child had wasted to his death. Little Henry, with his sturdy limbs and his rosy cheeks, what had he to do with the wasted shell they had lowered into the grave? Samuel Fleming sighed deeply. He had been glad almost to see the tormented child quieted at last. He had thought God had ta has taken him. Now there is neither hope nor fear. Now there is peace for us at last. Well, he had been wrong. Quite suddenly, the sickness had struck again, struck Catherine, beloved child of her father's first marriage, struck the baby Francis, doubly treasured because he was the only son now, Lord Ruse, heir to the earldom. Catherine had thrown off her sickness, the wild, headstrong little girl, but the baby had followed his brother into the grave. Still, Francis had borne himself patiently, not complaining against God, nor blaming any man, he had gone to London, as usual, to attend the King of News Newmarket, and which all, everything according to custom, except that a little coffin had gone with him for burial at Westminster. No one at court, even those who knew him well, had guessed at the depths of his sorrow, except the king, perhaps. James, for all of his foolishness, had an understanding heart. 
Sometimes his foolishness was lit by gleams a wise man might envy, but fate had not done with Francis yet. On his return home, the sickness struck again. The strange dire sick sickness, sparing his wife as little as himself as though God had meant to put an end to him and his family altogether. It was then that the whispering changed its tone. Now it was no longer satisfied to call the flower women whore. It called them witch. And it was then he should have listened, he, their pastor, and listened all the more since Francis refused. Francis in those days believed well of all men that any of his people, his own people to whom heart and purse were ever open should wish him evil was a thing not to be considered. So he had continued steadfast in his sickness, bearing all with patience and trusting in God. Samuel Fleming rose and paced restless. Catching Hester's worried look, he said sadly, it was that being brought face to face with the wickedness of his own people broke Francis at the last. Men like Francis are not broken. They are stronger for their grief. He will come back. You will see. God granted, he said. Francis may return, he thought, but I shall not see it, not with these mortal eyes. Hester went over and stood by him. Francis will come home and you will see him. Certainly he will come home to his own place and to those that love him. He turned his head that she might not see his grief and stared out over the bright garden. Francis will not come, not yet, not for a long while yet, if ever. He has fled from the great house bereft of the children. Yet come home, come home, Francis. You have wandered enough. You have turned your back on Christian lands, your only companions, black savages, unbaptized. And standing there, sending his heart out to Francis, he fancied he knew what the reply would be. Black savages are more white, more Christian than my own baptized people of Botsford. But still he went on beseeching, we are lonely without you. Castle and village, come home, Francis, and beget yourself an heir. It is time Francis came home and begot himself an heir. Hester said sad, suddenly with the trick she had of speaking his thoughts. I pray for it night and day, he fetched the deep sigh, thinking how in the good days before the trouble there had always been visitors up at the castle, not only the king and his friends, but wits and scholars and poets. Now the great house seemed empty as a tomb. A man needs to rub up his wits, he told Hester sadly. Mine are more than a little dusty. How lonely he is, she thought, watching the restless play of the fingers. Loneliness makes a man restless. Dear Samuel, Samuel, will you not walk abroad a little this fine day, she asked, knowing that as always his sad heart must lead him to his church, and God would for a little take away his loneliness. Why, yes, he said, and picked up his hat and cloak. He stepped into the wide, flagged passage and through the kitchens. It was the quicker way, and besides, he loved the wide, cool rooms with the great ovens and the scrub tables and the bright pans. Janae, the young maid, lifted a face all rosy from the fire and smiled. Are you wanting the mistress, she asked, bobbing to her curtsy. He shook his head, returning her smile, and stepped out of doors. Spring was warm in the rectory garden. He could feel life sitting in the black, moist earth. And in the bare espalades on the old, I don't know how to say that word, on the old yellow walls, he crossed the planks that led from the garden across the little river and into the churchyard. The smell of violets went with him all the way. It was quiet within the church of St. Mary the Virgin. Chilly, too, after the springtime garden, cold struck upward from the stone floor, through to the bones of the old man, he knelt a little clumsy to thank God, as he always did, that his work had fallen in so fair a spot. He rose and looked about him, loving this church of his. Gold candlelight upon gold alabaster and men and women lying here in the dignity of their last sleep. Even that frail countess who, fearing childbirth, had chosen to die instead, lay here, there, the fruit ungathered from the womb. Yes, even she, with her sick childish face and her thin body, save for the rounded belly, partook of that same high dignity of death. 
The candles threw a warm light upon the altar and upon the rough-hewn figure of Robert de Roos, watching over his buried heart. His body lay elsewhere, but his heart rested in this beloved place. He turned to consider the empty space on the south side of the chancel. Here the child lay. It is very lonely for a little boy, Catherine had said, with one of her rare flashes of imagination. Why did my father take Francis to lie in Westminster? Now it is lonely for them both. They are not lonely anymore, he had said to comfort this curious child, already half woman. They are God's lambs, and they lie in his bosom. Lambs like better to frisk and play, she had said, and had turned abruptly and left him, lest he should see tears in the large, dark eyes, a proud girl hiding her wild heart. Francis, too, would sleep here one day, already the mason had made his drawings for that tomb, for the tomb. Samuel did not like them very much. A great stone canopy arched high above the figure of Francis lying between his two wives. The great folds of their skirts overflowed on each side, engulfing him like the waves of the sea. The little boys knelt at their father's feet. And at his head, Catherine, it was all too large, too pretentious. It was too ugly, too sad. Each little boy carried a skull this dwelling upon death. But though it was best for Francis to turn his back upon the past, Samuel himself could not forget it. He never entered this church of his where the child lay and where the flower women had once knelt without asking himself how he had failed, how much was his own fault. And lately and more insistent than ever were the women truly witches. It was at him again, the question that had haunted him this twelve month and again he answered it. They had been witches if ever witches existed, and that witches did exist was beyond doubt. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. The scriptures had it plain, but he could not comfort himself that way. There were the ancient scriptures of the Jews. Men had learnt mercy since then, or had they? He turned from the altar and paced the stone flags of the aisle. Empty pews stretched left to right, left and right. If there were no witches, how was it that cattle had been curiously slain and men, women, and children died unnaturally and horribly? If these things had not been brought about by witchcraft, then had, then they had happened through human wickedness. Witchcraft or poison, the evildoer deserved to die. Murder was still murder. And what of those who willed evil, who employed no means but an evil spirit, not the familiar spirit, but their own wicked will, the will to slay. Then such a man deserved to die also, whether he had actually brought his wickedness about or not. Surely he who has murdered in his heart is as guilty as he who has done the deed. He turned again to face the altar. Spite and evil, these e things are never harmless. They are essences set free to work destruction. And yet, if for ill-wishing alone a man deserved to die, there wouldn't be enough gallows in England to hold them all. Besides, though the will to slay is evil, and it is still not so evil as the deed. For before the deed is done, a man may be drawn to repent, but the victim dead, God himself, cannot undo it. The deed is done. A little child goes down in fear and pain into the grave. Henry would be eleven now. Comely boy, a steady eye, his father's noble spirit that had been clear in him, young as he was, and the other child, an infant, scarce more than a babe at the breast when the trouble began. Six years old when he had died, he would be eight now or thereabouts. So much beauty, so much promise lost. If the children had died by human wickedness, whether by witchcraft or any other means, then one need not lament unduly upon what charge the murderers had died. He shook his head at that piece of sophistry. When the law takes away a man's life, then everyone must be clear about the reason. Yet he went on arguing with himself. If the witches had not died when they did, maybe Francis and Cecilia, yes, and Catherine too, would be lying here beside this child. But even that could not quiet his conscience. The only ones that could speak as to their innocence were the women themselves, and they had spoken, the mother denying, the daughters confessing, what had led Margaret and Philippa to embrace a shameful death? Had it been the devil betraying his own, or God in his infinite mercy condemning the flesh that they, that the soul might live? But suppose they had been innocent. 
His heart began to race again so that he was forced to lean more heavily, heavily upon the altar rail. Had their tongues been loosed by the cruelty of man to man, had they said anything, anything at all for a little sleep, a little respite from the continual questions? He had heard of such things in other places, perhaps, but not here, not here in Botsford, where he had sat on the bench with Eresby and Manners and Pelham, good Christians all, not that, oh God, not that. He went carefully upon his knees. A year ago, he had been certain of the justice they had received. Now he was no longer sure. Innocent people had been hanged before. Dear Christ, show him the truth, the truth about the women in whose death he had played his part. He rose stiffly and on his way out, paused for a moment at the place where his brother lay buried. Abraham, scholar and wit, dying unexpectedly, dying peacefully here before all the trouble began. Would to God he himself had died then. God grant at least that he also lay his tired bones in this dear place. He shut the heavy door behind him. His feet took him without his knowing through the churchyard and over the little stone bridge he himself had built, a narrow way for people to come into church, and through the marketplace and along the lane where the track disappearing into a copse, the witch's cottage still stood. Its windows were broken now where the villagers had thrust their billy hooks and weeds were growing high as the low chimney there was grass springing in the thatch. No one came near it now, not even in broad daylight. Evil clung about it, they said. You would never know when you mightn't turn it to face a wicked ghost. That was all nonsense, of course. And yet, even in this bright spring morning, there was something forbidding about the place. His feet went stumbling upon the trailing bushes, and he put out a hand to steady himself. He found himself staring into the red eyes of a cat a white and spiteful cat that seemed in two minds whether it should fly at his throat or run back into the bushes. He all but crossed himself. There he is. Wow.